and it's still got the very standard livery from Aeroflot. I have to say this plane has got a very distinctive smell. Flying on a 50 year old Soviet aircraft obviously poses some risks. Most people that know me well know that I've got three big passions. The first one is that I'm a big fan of the most remote latitudes of the world. The second one is that I'm also a big fan of places with really harsh climate conditions. And the third one is that I'm a big fan of civil aviation and I'm always on the lookout for the rarest aircraft that you can fly on these days. One of the regions of the world that I always found the most fascinating is the Arctic Circle. I've always been fascinated by the aura of mystery surrounding the North Pole and the area around it. It is one of the most unexplored parts of the world where you can find unique natural phenomena, harsh climate conditions and amazing landscapes that have no equal elsewhere on Earth. Because of this, the very few people who inhabit these latitudes live a life that is substantially different from the lives of the rest of us normal human beings. We've already had the opportunity to visit the Arctic Circle on this channel. We ventured as far north in Russia as we possibly could, reaching the semi-abandoned Soviet settlement of Vorkuta, which was the site of one of the most infamous gulags in Soviet history. In our previous mission to Vorkuta, we had to rely on the train, which was really the only reliable transport for people to reach places at such a northern latitude in such a prohibitive climate. However, a few weeks ago, while spending my Saturday night browsing Wikipedia articles about the rarest airplanes in use today, I discovered the existence of some Soviet-made planes that the Russians still use to perform scheduled flights to outposts like Vorkuta. Amongst them is the legendary Antonov 24, a twin-engine turboprop aircraft designed designed and built in the early 1970s by the Soviet Union. Despite being over 50 years old, these Antonovs are still used to transport civilian passengers beyond that imaginary line at 66 degrees latitude that marks the Arctic Circle. As soon as I found out, I decided to leave on a secret mission to the Russian North Pole on a 50-year-old Antonov 24 towards one of the cities with the most fascinating yet saddest history in the former Soviet Union. I feel like a Pope <laughs> speaking to you from the balcony of one of the rooms of Hotel Siktivka. I feel like a Pope of the commie blocks of the capital of the commie republic in northern Russia. I mean, Siktivkar latitude is currently 61 degrees north, but our goal is to go up, is to go north and reach, by the end of today, hopefully, 68 degrees of latitude. And we're going to be reaching the 68th parallel near the populated center of Vorkuta, which we are going to be reaching on an Antonov 24. That day in Siktivkar, we were going to leave the fate of our young life in the hands of a regional airline by the name of Komi Aviatrans. It has its base at Siktivkar Airport and its fleet includes a couple of old Antonov 24s, three Czech L-410s and a few Soviet helicopters. These are all used to maintain regular air links between the capital of the Komi Republic and the many sparse settlements in the region where paved roads are lacking. As far as Vorkuta is concerned, this is a flight that is scheduled twice weekly, but that it's often cancelled due to weather conditions. I'm actually super late as usual because the flight is at 9 a.m. and I was checking out from the hotel at 8 but hopefully the airport is not too far from the city center it's going to be a very small airport and to be honest the reason why I was late 
is because it was taking me like half an hour to get dressed, to get ready for the very harsh winter here in the Republic of Komi. It's currently minus 16 degrees according to the thermometer of this car and it's going to get even colder as we go farther north. The latitude will increase and at the same time the temperature will decrease and will go down all the way to minus 30. But hopefully these Antonovs were built and designed to withstand the very harsh winters of the Soviet Union in the 1970s. So we should be alright. Svidania! Well, if you've ever wondered what an airport in Siktivkar looks like, there you go! It says over there, Aeroport, just because this is an airport. It does not look like a Soviet airport, I have to say. This was probably built or maybe renovated in the early 2000s because it's got that very same exact style of most governmental buildings here in the Arctic in Russia. You see these white and blue tiles that supposedly keep the interior of this building, of this airport, very isolated from the frosty winds of the Russian north. Man, we really need to get inside. The total population of the Komi Republic is only 300,000, so there were only very few people at the airport. I didn't need to wait long before having the chance to hand my passport at the kind lady at the check-in counter. All the stuff there was fairly surprised, which made sense considering that the last time that they had seen an Italian passport there was in 1864. <laughs> At this point, I also needed to ask a logistics question. When I first navigated to the very iconic website of Komi Avia Trans to purchase my ticket, I had noticed that the flight from Siktivkar to Vorkuta wasn't actually listed as a Siktivkar Vorkuta flight. What was listed instead were two distinct segments, Siktivkar Pechora and Pechora Vorkuta. All of this despite my boarding card indicating a direct flight from Siktivkar to Vorkuta. Well, obviously, there's not much that is more difficult than filming in a Russian airport, especially of this size. But I can let you know that I've managed to check in and I'm now sitting at the only gate of Siktivkar Airport. Wow. I think there's around 20 to 25 people here who will be on our flight, on our Antonov flight to Vorkuta. And I don't know whether you were able to catch that from the short conversation that I was having with the girl at check-in, but apparently this Antonov flight is going to be a bit like being on a bus because we're not flying direct from Siktivkar to Vorkuta, but we're also not connecting anywhere. What is going to happen is that this plane is going to land halfway through in the town of Pechora, around 64 to 65 degrees of latitude, and a few passengers will get off at Pechora, and a few passengers will get on at Pechora, and then our plane will take off again and land again all the way towards Vorkuta. Whereas what we're going to do is just we're gonna be sitting on the plane. <laughs> We just needed a very short bus ride to get from the airport terminal, which you can still see over there, for the second time in the history of this channel to an Antonov 24. And again, same as it was in Kazakhstan, it's an Antonov 24 RV, an even rarer model of the Antonov 24. Look at it, which is now ready to take flight into the very remote north of Russia and of the Komi Republic. Look at it, with its two turboprop engines, one on one side and one on the other, and it's still got the very standard livery from Aeroflot back in the days of Soviet Aeroflot, with this white livery, a grey belly and a blue straight line 
running across it. We didn't manage to get a window seat, unfortunately, so we won't be able to see all the amazing landscapes, all the amazing frosty, snowy landscapes of the Komi Republic from up there, but we'll try and see what we can do. I mean, we've flown on an Anton of 24 before, so this is nothing new for us, right? The thing that is going to be the most fascinating for us today is obviously the destination. Let's go. Boarding the Anton of 24 didn't prove to be easy at all, with us passengers having to cross fields of deep snow just to get to the rear door of the aircraft where we were greeted by the single flight attendant operating the flight. Roughly 1,024s were built between the 1970s and the 1980s, and boy oh boy, they all looked the freaking same. And this was no exception. The cabin was very retro, featuring a mix of grey and blue colors with the very traditional Soviet sexy curtains by the windows. Right, so we managed to board successfully. I have to say, this plane has got a very distinctive smell of most Soviet airplanes that are still operating out there. I'm not quite sure how it happened, but I still managed to get myself a window seat. And to add to that, we've got a very good seat because we can look out one of the biggest windows I've ever seen on an airplane towards the left wing of this Antonov 24, look at it. While we were taxiing towards the runway, I stopped for a minute to think about how absolutely amazed I was at the thought of how airports like this are forced to operate in such weather conditions for maybe six or even seven months per year. And I was really looking forward to seeing the airports even further north, such as in Pechora and Vorkuta, which not only have to deal with weather like this, but I also have to operate in complete darkness due to the polar night. But anyway, at least traffic is not really that much of an issue at Sigtivkar airport, so we soon got the green light from ATC. successfully taking off from Siktivkar, we had now officially passed the first of the four most critical phases of our mission to Vorkuta. That meant that we could have the chance to relax a bit and we had the time to find out more about the details of our AN-24 which was taking us further north. Registration number RA46493, having performed its first flight in December 1972. 51 years old, but didn't really look a day over 50. What was actually interesting is that even though the flight was shown as operated by Comi Avia Trans, RA46493 was not actually property of Comi Avia Trans. My understanding of what happened was that the original Anton of 24 of Comi Aviatrans that was scheduled to perform this flight was out for repairs and Comi Aviatrans had to go and borrow an airplane from another company and by sheer coincidence this airplane happened to be another Anton of 24 and it happened to be of the same age. I was actually looking at this safety car right here and apparently even though I bought my ticket for this flight not even two days ago on the website of Comi Avia Trans, which is the regional airline of the Comi Republic, this airplane is actually owned by the local division of Ute, and this flight is actually performed by Ute, which is a low-cost Russian carrier on a national level, but it does have its own regional divisions 
for some of the northern republics of Russia, as is the case here for the Komi Republic. You can see here, Antonov 24. But as I was telling you, I did buy my ticket for 5,000 rubles on the Komi Avia Trans website, a very retro website, I have to say, but it did the job. And it's interesting because I was doing the math. So a ticket for the whole flight between Sigdivkar and Vorkuta is 5,000 rubles and this Anton of 24 has a maximum capacity of 48 passengers meaning that in order to operate the flight between Sigdivkar and Vorkuta you need what? 2,500 euros which is surprisingly cheap told the phone signal disappeared only briefly as one of the passengers must have pressed the button to request a stop as you usually do on buses. It felt like the time for the first landing of the day wasn't too far off as even the flight attendant came around the aisle distributing sweets for the sake of our ears. So we're now back below the clouds was an announcement from the captain just now there's not much to go until we land in Pechora which by the way is where the northernmost road here in the Komi Republic pretty much ends the city the town of Vorkuta is so isolated because the only way to get there is by train or as we're doing today by plane there's no road leading to Vorkuta because the road going north from Sigdivkar goes through populated centers such as Ukhta, Usinsk and it ends right here in Pechora. Between Pechora and Vorkuta there's absolutely nothing. There's miles and miles of tundra, of forests. I would just now see the wheel coming back out. Look at them. And the only way to continue on from Pechora to Vorkuta is, as I was saying, only by train or by plane. But again, the problem is that today we were very lucky with the weather because there's no snow and even though visibility is quite poor our an 24 can operate without any issue but it happens very often that flights need to be cancelled because of snow or even worse fog there are many ways for an attempt to land on a frozen runway on a 50-year-old Soviet airplane to end in disaster. The whole landing gear could have burst upon contact as soon as the wheels touched the ground or the pilot could have applied an unbalanced amount of pressure to the brakes, causing the plane to swerve off the runway. But luckily for us, none of this happened and we successfully landed in Pechora for our intermediate stop. We had now safely reached the halfway point of our mission and we were taken to the very interesting air terminal of Pechora to have a rest. And Ladas and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the waiting room of the airport, of the very Soviet airport here in Pechora. We're just now doing our first and only stop of our way towards Vorkuta and they pretty much kicked us off the plane because they have to refuel. And for safety reasons, we all know that safety is paramount here in Russia. Apparently they're not allowed to have any passengers on board while they're doing their refueling, which they're doing just now. So we have to wait here for around <laughs> half an hour and then we will be allowed on board again. This amazing UN-24 which can really fly 
in any weather, in any temperature, but obviously it just needs some kerosene, right? As I was low-key doing my filming at Pechora Airport, I was approached by a random dude of roughly my age who was very curious about my kind of vernacular that he had never really heard spoken before at such latitudes. Привет, меня зовут Денис, <laughs> и мы с Дэвидом летим в Воркуту. В Воркуту, йо, привет, Прошу. очень приятно. Давиде, а ты родом откуда? Сам я родом из Воркуты. Какое-то время назад переехал в Сыктывкар. Так что ты родился во Воркуте, а вырос в Сыктывкаре? До 16 лет. Рос в Воркуте, потом переехал. Вау, ты делала в школу, ты жил при полярной ночи. А это первый раз для тебя на таком самолете? На самолете, да. Обычно я катался на поезде. Обычно на поезде, да. Ну, интересный опыт. <laughs> After making friends with Denis, it was time to board the Antonov once again, but not until having tried to capture a decent thumbnail for this video. The Antonov was a bit emptier for the second leg of the journey. I was imagining that most people had already reached their final destination in Pechora, or maybe there were some people that had had enough and had decided to get off the plane and continue onwards to Vorkuta by train. But we, we were very much eager to go all the way until the finish line. We were very much determined to go as north as humanly possible on an Antonov 24. So we're now back on the Antonov and have managed to get the blessing from the lone flight attendant that is working on this airplane today to sit on an empty seat on the opposite side of the airplane to the one that I was seated at for the first leg of this journey. So now I've got an amazing view over the right engine of this Antonov. You can look at it from here as we're already taxiing towards the runway. I've also decided that we're going to have a clear goal for this mission just because we said that we're going to reach the Arctic Circle. I've decided that we won't be able to call this mission as a completed mission until we will lay our eyes on this monument right here which is supposed to be in Borkuta and as you can see here it indicates the beginning of the Arctic Circle so we will land in Borkuta and then we will have to put in some extra effort to get to this monument right here to be honest, I was quite surprised that the flight attendant had let me change my seat from my assigned one. Usually, aboard this type of plane, passengers are not allowed to swap seats in order to facilitate the process of identification of bodies in case of a fatal crash. It was with these thoughts in mind that I blissfully admired our final takeoff for the day, sitting back and enjoying the last leg all the way to Vorkuta on the reclining seats of the Antonov, which, by the way, we're reclining in both directions. It seems like the cruising speed that we're now settling on is much lower than the first segment of the flight, just because I imagine that this leg is actually shorter, and what is interesting is that I want you guys to look at the time. It's currently 12.05 p.m. and look at what we have now looking outside our biggest window that's that's the light of the sunset the sun is currently setting I imagine that now we're between 65 and 66 degrees north and the sun is now setting at midday that is crazy to think about right and another fact that my mind is absolutely boggling about is obviously global warming is a massive issue for humanity and we can definitely see the impact of global warming not only in Italy but also in places like Russia where I get it it's cold and everything but it used to get much colder than this for a much prolonged time than this winters here in Russia have gotten noticeably shorter than they used to be a few decades ago but still just because we're used to very mild winters now in Italy and the summers to be unbearably hot it's still very much refreshing to say 
so much snow and it's very much refreshing to think that these are the landscapes that in winter cover a huge portion of our world because if you think about it the arctic circle goes from Tromso in Norway to Sweden, Finland, Rovaniemi and then it crosses into Russia where you've got Murmansk, Vorkuta, Salihar, going further east, the Nove Urengoy, Norilsk, going to Chukotka, and then you've got the Bering Strait, you've got Alaska, and then you've got the upper north latitudes of Canada, you've got Alert, the northernmost populated town in the whole world, and then you come back into Europe through Greenland. And it's crazy to think about that. If you were to take a plane across any of the destinations that I've just mentioned, you would be able to look outside your plane window and what you would see is a landscape that looks exactly like this. be lying to my dear viewers if I said that the landing that I had in Vorkuta was not one of the softest landings that I've ever had. Much better than trying to land in Dublin on a windy day on a Ryanair 737. At this point I was immensely happy at the idea of having survived the 51 year old Anton of 24 experience and I was even happier at the thought of finally being back to one of my most favorite places on Earth, the Arctic Circle, and more specifically, Vorkuta. Disembarking the Anton of 24 was also a bittersweet experience because deep down in me I knew that these type of planes would not continue to be operated forever and ever, and sooner or later, sooner rather than later, they would be retired. Well guys, we've made it, and I have to say, even the bus that is taking us to the terminal is actually very interesting. <laughs> I'm thinking that this bus is probably as old as the airplane was. Say bye to the Antonov 24 that took us all the way to the Arctic Circle. Well done, Mr. Antonov.
and we've made it to the most freezing airport grounds in the history of airport grounds oh my god <laughs> I had to take out the heavy artillery as you can see <laughs> just because it's minus 20 now and this is the main square in front of the airport you've got a residential building over there which is quite interesting you've got a second residential building over there but most importantly the most remarkable thing that you can find here is this thing right here which is very fitting for a video about soviet aviation that i show you this mig chitiri this mig 4 helicopter which used to be flown by aeroflot God knows how many years ago you can see that it's written Aeroflot. It has the livery of the old Soviet helicopters from Aeroflot, and the model is CCCP 66857. So, if there's any other AV geek that is watching this video, please let me know the routes or the routes that this helicopter used to fly on before it became a monument to Soviet aviation here in front of the airport of Vorkuta. So there's only one thing that is left for us to do, which is going to pay homage to the monument to the 67th parallel here nearby Vorkuta. In order to do that, I don't think we can really rely on public transport here. So we will have to find a private taxi if we can. And then we will worry about finding a hotel later on in the day. Но считаешь, что ты со мной, но в Аркута не опасный город вообще? Думаю, что нет. Думает, что нет. Не опаснее, чем любой другой город России. Ну да. My battery is already dying because of the cold. It's still surviving as of now. But the good thing is that we've got company for our mission to the 67th parallel monument. Здравствуйте. So there was this guy that I was talking to while we were stopped at the airport in Pechora. His name is Dennis. Everybody meet Dennis. Hi Dennis, say hello to the camera. <laughs> and he's a native of Vorkuta and I have to say he's the kindest native of Vorkuta because he has offered to come with me to the monument to the 67th parallel. And it looks like indeed we've made it! Oh my god, I'm filming with a camera on one hand and with my power bank on the other just because it's so freaking cold that my battery could actually die any moment now. It's still holding on for now, but anyway... We did make it! And we made it in style! We've made it all the way to the monument which says Vorkuta and then you've got a sphere which is right in the middle and it's then surrounded by this ring it sort of reminds me of the planetary structure of Saturn if you think about it, right? it says there, Vorkuta and then 67th parallel wow, this is amazing Dennis, thank you so much for your help, man that was very appreciated and it was absolutely fantastic and it was very appreciated из Воркуте. Вообще, я не представляю, как можно жить на таком севере. Ты будешь рассказать. And for us, well, the next flight out of Воркута is not until Friday, and it's Wednesday now, meaning that we still have at least two days to spend at such a northern latitude, and surely we'll take the chance to explore and see what it's like to live in such a place. Guys, thank you so much for keeping me company on this adventure on one of the most amazing airplanes that the Soviet mind could engineer. <laughs> and I'll see you next time. Cheers! Thank you! Bye!